Park in the planning and communications team under Best Over. Just want to let everybody know that all your microphones are muted. Uh, if you have any questions that you want to ask of Beth or Julia, you'll have kind of a chat question box. Uh, you'll want to use that during the presentation to type your questions in, and we'll reserve time at the end of the webinar to answer your questions. And if you have any other technical issues, feel free to use your chat box and I'll try my best to help answer them uh, either during the webinar or I'll chat you privately. With that, I'll turn it back to Beth. Okay, thanks, Tom. So welcome again to the Strategic and Communications and Recruitment RFP. Um, we have uh, issued this RFP request for proposals from DFSS, where the Chicago Department of Family and Support Services. We um, administer uh, many of the city's uh, social service programs um, that are publicly funded, either through federal or state funding, and um, sometimes local funding. And in particular, this RFP concerns the Children Services Division, or CSD. Uh, next slide. So our mission at DFSS is to work with community partners to connect Chicago residents and families to resources that build stability and support their well-being and empower them to thrive. Um, we have four pri priorities to deliver uh, high quality ser services, to collaborate with our partners and sister agencies, um, to make sure the public knows about the resources available to them, and to steward resources responsibly and effectively. Next slide. So Children's Services, um, we administer uh, Chicago early learning programs in community-based organizations. And community-based organizations might be anything from um, a social service agency uh, like El Valor, Metropolitan Family Services, Easter Seals, I'm just naming some um, off the top of my head, to faith-based agencies, um, uh, churches, uh, Trinity United Child Care, Judah International Child Care, uh, charter schools, um, LEARN, uh, Montessori Network, um, and the like. The, the main thing that distinguishes Chicago Early Learning programs, which might be delivered in center-based home visiting or family child care homes, is that they're not through uh, Chicago public schools. So that is the other side of the house that's run by CPS, Chicago Public Schools. So at Children's Services, um, we have three early learning goals. Um, we want to maximize the high quality of the early learning programs um, in community. Um, we want to reduce barriers for children and families to enter into these programs. Um, we want to improve the comprehensiveness and quality of early learning programs across the city. Um, and we want to sure, ensure that there's a strong system of service providers for um, and relieve their administrative burden uh, when they're dealing with all of these uh, uh, different funding sources. Um, so next slide. So Chicago Early Learning Programs in community-based agencies are funded by Federal Head Start, Early Head Start, Early Head Start Child Care Partnership, and Early Head Start Expansion. I'll refer to those four funding streams as Head Start. Um, and also by state early childhood block grant funding, um, which gets articulated as preschool for all for uh, preschool age children, three to five, and prevention initiative for pregnant women and infants and toddlers, zero to three. Uh, we have about 100 direct service delegate agencies that we fund through these funding streams. Um, and they are provided at roughly 350 sites throughout the city of Chicago. Um, our programs are either center-based, they're in a licensed family child care home where you might have a, a family provider who brings children into her house or his house um, and takes care of them during the day or sometimes in the evening, or uh, home-based home visiting models. 
Our programs are full or part year. They're full or part day. And we serve roughly about 15,000 children and their families. Sometimes these um, pro, uh, our agencies layer funding streams um, in order to enhance the experience for children. So in the end, it's about 15,000 children. Uh, next slide. So our program goals are to increase the school readiness of, of children when they matriculate into kindergarten. So they are ready to learn. Um, we want to support early learning and child development every step along the way. Um, we want to support families in advocating for their children and so that they're able to leave our programs and continue to advocate for their um, children. And we also want to support family stability. And so our programs connect uh, families to other resources they might need, anything ranging from um, GED classes to um, housing services to mental health services and the like. Um, so our programs are very comprehensive that way because we understand that children are part of a family and in order to support children you also have to support the family. Next slide. So um, just to give you a little bit more background about Chicago Early Learning Programs, um, we think about our programs in terms of uh, many content areas. So obviously, um, or maybe obviously, education um, is a main um, emphasis. Um, but we also make sure that we are providing services for children with disabilities. So we have services uh, that are uh, associated with education with disabilities. We have a whole set of services that are associated with family and community engagement. And this is about connecting uh, families to services in their community, um, engaging families in their children's education and the like. Um, health services, we make sure children enrolled have a medical home and a dental home. Um, mental health services, we want to connect both our families to mental health services when needed. We want to make sure that staff are connected to mental health services when needed. Uh, nutrition services, uh, we want to make sure that uh, children and families have access to uh, nutritional food, that they, um, uh, that our programs provide uh, snacks, breakfast, lunch, um, and the like. Um, we have a whole set of program uh, standards around eligibility, recruitment, selection, enrollment, and attendance, which is where uh, strategic communications and recruitment come, uh, comes in kind of more directly and less peripherally. And then we have what's called program design management. And these are all sorts of uh, program management uh, components, everything from record keeping and reporting to human resources, to data management, to monitoring and the like. Health and safety, this is always an issue when you're dealing with children and families. We have to make sure that our facilities are, um, are uh, high quality and safe for children. And lastly, transportation for children. Um, so that's a little bit about our programs. Um, I would definitely recommend looking um, on our website, also uh, going to uh, Head Start, and you could find out a lot about sort of the um, universe of early learning programs if you're unfamiliar with them um, at those resources. Uh, next slide. So. We have, uh, like I said, about 100 direct service uh, uh, agencies, delegate agencies uh, across the city who provide direct uh, early childhood services um, at 350 sites. Then we also have what we call support service uh, contractors, and this is a support service contract RFP. Uh, for um, Chicago Early Learning Programs, support service contractors are there to help CSD um, with their expertise in particular areas. For example, we don't have mental health specialists on staff, so we use support service contractors to bring in people who have credentials and degrees in that area to ensure that the services we and our agencies are providing around mental health are up to industry standards. Um, so in this case, um, we are not uh, specialists in uh, marketing and messaging and the like, and so we are looking for a subject matter expert um, to help us and support us in um, 
strategic communications and recruitment across the city. Next slide. So in particular, the goal of this RFP. So we are seeking one entity that can provide subject matter expertise and project support to DFSS and our direct service delegate agencies in subjects related to strategic communications and recruitment. Due to these activities, this is what we would like to see happen. We want to have a year-round recruitment and messaging campaign that engages our delegate agencies and families across the city and leads to ongoing full program enrollment. Um, we want to make sure that this recruitment and messaging uh, campaign has strategies that emphasize the importance of early learning, of early learning principles, of engaging parents. We want people to know why early learning is important. Why is it important that you enroll your children? Um, why is it important that you attend our programs? Uh, what's so great about early learning? Um, and then lastly, we want to make sure that the communication platforms that we're using for ongoing recruitment and enrollment and also just ongoing communication with our internal and external stakeholders are, are well run and um, are uh, strategically conveying the messages we want to convey uh, around early learning. Next slide. So a little bit more about recruitment and enrollment. Um, in the city of Chicago, right now, there are two main routes to enrollment in a Chicago Early Learning Program. Um, not that one is better than the other, just one is one, one and one is two. One is the online application. The website to connect to that is right here. Um, this is an online application for preschool-aged programs for children three to five years old. Um, and it is inclusive of community-based, um, center-based or uh, uh, programs for children, as well as CPS-based programs for children. So this is a collaborative effort between uh, DFSS and CPS um, for children three to five. In addition to the online application, um, a family can enroll in a Chicago Early Learning Program in a community-based agency by going to a Chicago Early Learning site. You, know, you can walk down to the child care center down the street if it has funding from us um, and enroll your child uh, in uh, the program there. So this ability to walk into a Chicago Early Learning site is for all um, programs zero to five that take place in uh, Chicago early learning community-based agency sites. And some things to know about this, um, this process, um, I think that which is important for uh, communication and, and messaging is that when a, when a family enters into a Chicago early learning site is the moment that relationship building begins with that family that we want them to uh, engage with our agency staff. We want them to feel warm. We want them to keep coming back and finish the process. So that relationship be, uh, building starts first contact. Um, one thing that will happen then is there'll be a discussion about the family needs and the family history. They're uh, all about them and what they need and, and, and what the agency is able to do for, for them. And then the other thing that's very important to understand is that there's also an eligibility verification process that's going to happen as well, where we need documentation. Sometimes that's just a note um, from the parent testifying to their income. Sometimes they have to bring in stubs um, and, and the like. Um, so there is an eligibility verification process that happens too. But that might not happen exactly in that first contact, but, but the need for that information will be shared. Okay, next slide. So some of our um, standards around el what we call in our world eligibility, recruitment, selection, enrollment, and attendance that might be happy. And this is on our CELS 2.0, page 70. It is referenced in the RFP. There's a link to it. Um, all of our programs have to prioritize uh, the enrollment of the neediest children. And they determine that not only by like income eligibility, uh, 
uh, which is 100% um, for 100% uh, FPL or below for uh, Head Start eligibility or 200% or below for uh, early childhood block grant eligibility. Um, not only that, but they create for their agency and their site based on their community, uh, their understanding of, of which children should be prioritized. So maybe they're homeless children, maybe they're children who uh, are speaking, uh, are non-English uh, speakers, uh, English language learners. Maybe uh, there is some other characteristic about those children and families that prioritize them for enrollment. Um, so they have to create what we call selection criteria to prioritize the enrollment of the neediest or most vulnerable children in their immediate service area. Uh, second, uh, they are supposed to maintain full enrollment. So we say, oh, agency X, we're gonna give you 50 seats for children. So we have the expectation that they stay fully enrolled all year with those 50 seats. Um, and so we encourage that that every agency and every site have, has a waiting list in case a child ends up dropping out because maybe he or she moves out of town or something like that. And so we want to make sure that there's an, another child to take that space. So because we're always um, enrolling children, because um, some of our families are very um, transient and, and, and they move around a lot, we want to emphasize that recruitment is a year-round process. Of course, there's a push in the late spring and through the summer months because the program year starts September 1 where it aligns with the school year. However, you know, people need childcare, they need early learning all year round, right? So we want to ensure that recruitment is and messaging is happening year round. Um, and lastly, it's very important that we want to support the important importance of regular attendance. If you don't attend the program, you don't benefit from it, you know, regardless of your enrollment status. So that's another important element um, for uh, URSIA, as we call it, the acronym we use here in the early childhood is. Next slide. So this is the Head Start Program Performance Standard. Uh, uh, this is the, our main goal as far as enrollment is concerned for the, the Head Start funded programs. Again, in the RFP, these standards are um, linked to, so you can uh, read up on it, but uh, that um, for eligibility, recruitment, selection, enrollment, and attendance, in order to reach those most in need of services, a program must develop and implement a recruitment process designed to actively inform all families with eligible children within the recruitment area of the availability of program services and encourage and assist them in applying for admission to the program. A program must include specific efforts to actively locate and recruit children with disabilities and other vulnerable children, including homeless children and children in foster care. So this RFP is about a, a, an a, uh, finding an agency who can help us with our recruitment campaign, with our messaging campaign, and to ensure that all families know in the city of Chicago, that's our recruitment area, know about our programming, uh, know where our services are located, know how they can go ahead and enroll in those programs. And we wanna specifically target and look to uh, children and families uh, who um, are sometimes the hardest to reach, uh, children with disabilities, children who are experiencing homelessness, uh, children who are in foster care, other vulnerable, um, hard to reach populations um, who will benefit uh, from these programs. Next. Uh, so one thing we do to, to help with that is that uh, as part of our Head Start um, requirements, the city of Chicago produces a community needs assessment annually uh, about the children and the, in the city of Chicago, uh, their characteristics, uh, how many children are there are, how many children are under 100% FPL, federal poverty level, how many children are under 200% FPL, where they are. Um, and there's a link to this in the RFP too that you can look at, um, but it's helpful to know, of course, um, who's living out there. And so uh, next slide. 
this is the target audience. So um, according to our estimates, um, there are about 196,000 children in the city of Chicago who are under age six. And of those children, about 91,000 of them are eligible for our CELL programs, our Chicago Early Learning programs. Um, about 91% are PFA, PI, our uh, Preschool for All Prevention Initiative, Early Childhood Block Grant uh, funded eligible. That's a state funding source. And they have to be living at or below 200% of the federal poverty level. Citywide, there's about 45,000 children under age six who are eligible for Head Start funding. And again, that's any of those four different Head Start funding streams. And to be Head Start eligible, you have to be uh, at or below 100% of the federal poverty level. Um, so, and then there's also for Head Start a, a, another um, type of eligibility, which is called categorical eligibility. And these are children and families who are experiencing homelessness, living in foster care, or receiving supplemental security income or temporary aid for needy families. These families are uh, categorically or automatically eligible for Head Start. Um, and, and usually they're also, um, they, they all fall under the 200% FPL for PFA, PI. Okay, next slide. So, um, I'm just going to say again, kind of, uh, that we, uh, our priorities are um, to work with a, a support service a vendor, a support service contractor, to produce and implement a recruitment engagement campaign that includes messaging that increases the recruitment and enrollment and attendance of children and families from vulnerable communities, number one. Uh, number two, we want to maintain full enrollment um, in our programs and have waiting lists um, across funding streams and program models. And we want to make sure that we're maintaining uh, consistent communication in multiple languages as needed uh, with our stakeholders. Um, and that may include uh, not only families, uh, but also our delegate agencies, child and community advocates, uh, governing bodies and parent policy council and other agencies. Uh, we want to make sure that these platforms we have for strategic communication are functioning well. Next slide. So these are the required activities and they're, uh, this is listed out directly from the RFP. The main thing, number one, design, implement, and support a year-round recruitment and messaging campaign. Uh, this is the main task of uh, the support service, uh, support service contractor for strategic communications and recruitment. Um, you know, we, we use a blend typically, we have in the past of traditional and new media, um, virtual and physical outreach and grassroots strategies. Um, we work in coordination and the support service contractor will be um, definitely be included in this coordination with CPS and the mayor's office. I think the main thing to emphasize here is that uh, the, the target audience we're trying to reach is not always easily reachable um, through traditional means of uh, messaging and marketing. So it's uh, important to find these families where they live and reach out to them and connect with them and get them into uh, these programs. Um, next slide, so that's number one. Number two, so design the, the recruitment campaign. Number two, provide traditional media outreach. Yeah, we do do radio advertising. Um, we have billboards uh, that maybe you see sometimes across the city for Chicago Early Learning. CTA, I see them when I'm on the bus. Uh, some of the, you know, sign up now, Chicago Early Learning um, and community print ads. Um, so we want to use all these strategies, of course. Um, and um, you, when you when we look at the cost proposal at the end, you'll see how they're kind of fit into this um, this kind of uh, the, the bottom of the cost proposal. Um, but so we'll need to have traditional media uh, outreach will be one requirement of this contractor. Uh, three. Oh, next slide. Sorry, Tom. Digital media outreach. 
Um, the campaign will be expected to deploy digital marketing stri uh, strategies that are likely to engage Chicago early learning eligible children and families. Um, you know, we definitely have uh, English speakers, we have Spanish speakers, we have other language speakers, uh, depending on what part of the city we're, um, we're targeting. You know, again, this is where we want um, uh, innovative strategies that are likely to reach and uh, the communities that we're interested in reaching and where we need um, uh, a, a contractor with subject matter expertise to, um, to really uh, uh, maximize and optimize uh, these platforms so we're able to, to reach our families um, or our potential families. Uh, for uh, next slide. So site level marketing, digital toolkit for cell site based programs. So like I said, we have 100 delegate agencies across the city and then they have 350 sites. So one of the biggest challenges with uh, Chicago Early Learning is for, for, for families to know we're there, for families to know, yes, this is a childcare agency that I can walk in and I can get a certain set of services from the city of Chicago. And so one of the things that we would like to make sure is developed is a way for marketing materials to be tailored to the needs of individual sites. So they can have their hours of operations on them, that they can say that, yes, you know, that there's a, there's a brand across the city and this particular site is providing the service and here's something about us um, that's tailored to our agency and who we serve and what we're about. So the site level marketing, really what we're talking is about is taking the citywide uh, brand and the citywide recruitment campaign and um, coming up with a way so that each individual site can say something and, uh, about itself and market itself using some of the same strategies and tools. Um, okay, uh, next slide. So likewise, uh, one thing that we need is, because we have 350 agencies, um, campaign materials and supplies so need to be printed and delivered to agencies. They're the people that, that each of our agencies has a mini recruitment campaign, you can say, where they're going out into their local com communities, they're knocking on doors, they're um, uh, going to local block club events, going to churches, going to their local grocery store, going to uh, places in their local community within a certain mile radius typically where they're most likely to recruit families into their programs. And so um, we need to make sure that uh, marketing and messaging uh, materials uh, get to those sites and those agencies. Um, as well. So that's part of the required activities is printing and getting um, uh, materials out to agencies. Uh, next slide. And then uh, another required activity is community events, outreach, and coordination. Um, of course, how this looks uh, this year is, is not quite um, clear. Um, but next year, we don't know what it'll look like. That's when this um, contract would kick in. Um, but typically, uh, a lot of uh, families can be reached through community events. And uh, we do like a Bud Billiken parade, other parades, uh, uh, street festivals, aldermanic events, other events in the community, any place where we can have a presence, a Chicago Early Learning, hey, Here's the local child care that's providing uh, Chicago early learning. We want families, uh, local families to know about it. Um, and one of the things that will happen with uh, community events outreach and coordination is that we work with um, a grassroots team of parents through a different sports service contractor and there'll be some um, coordination with that um, because uh, we like to pull in parents into this process of reaching out to community um, because they've been there and they know about it and they can sell our program and things like that. So we do have a set of cell Chicago Early Learning Parent Ambassadors that the 
uh, for the the community events outreach and coordination there might be coordination and collaboration with um, during these sorts of events uh, next slide Okay, promotional items, giveaways. Uh, usually we like to have uh, child-friendly items that have Chicago Early Learning and Head Start and, uh, and the like on them um, that can be given out to children or to adults, um, something like that, that uh, uh, promotional items. So uh, next, training. So this is maybe a little bit, um, uh, uh, unusual for a, uh, a marketing agency or a messaging agency, but one of the things that, um, as a subject matter expert, this is how we think of you, um, is that sometimes uh, our agencies need um, a little training uh, with, okay, uh, we have this overarching campaign for the citywide, we got the CTA going, and there's radio spots, and there's digital marketing, and there's a website, um, and we have these materials, um, but we'd also like our subject matter expertise, strategic communications rec and recruitment um, support service contractor to provide some training to our agencies about how to use the materials, how to how to reach these hard to reach populations, um, how to how to uh, get the the community and family involved in. Um, enrolling, recruiting, enrolling, attending programs. So, um, and the number of trainings I think is, is uh, uh, marked in the um, cost proposal. Um, and will we invite the site-based leaders to these and so they can benefit from um, hearing experts talk about uh, creative ways of reaching families. Next. Website maintenance. So this moves more or less from the recruitment and kind of into the uh, strategic communications uh, avenue. Uh, we will need the selected support service agency to host and update the CSD website. I think that there is, it's currently at www.childrenservices.chicago.com. Um, we are currently working on uh, updating it. Um, whomever is chosen as the, uh, uh, the support service contractor, um, they will um, have to work with us to make sure it remains accurate, user friendly, host it, um, and work with us to make sure that it uh, meets the needs of our stakeholders um, and that uh, it aligns with other uh, Chicago Early Learning program messaging across other platforms and materials. So this is usually a website that, you know, who uses this the most is our agencies because it's our way of having all the forms up there that they need. It's a way of making announcements and things like that. Um, so we kind of do that work of, of what needs to be on it content wise, but we need somebody else to host, a, host it and, um, and, and work with us to maintain it. Uh, next slide. Communication support. So this is more general strategic communication support too. Um, we only have so many resources in-house, and so sometimes uh, we like to use um, external contractors to help us um, with uh, format writing, drafting, proofreading, uh, formatting manuals or reports or guides or websites um, or social media events or things like that. We just wanna make sure that there's consistent and accurate messaging um, concerning our programs, our expectations, and their outcomes across these. Um, trans oh, and translating. So translating, drafting, editing, and formatting program-related materials is really what this um, required activity is about. Um, you know, we, uh, uh, we have uh, policies and procedures that we update. We have a community needs assessment that we update. Um, and we have various reports we uh, issue and things like that where we don't always have in-house the uh, resources we need to format and, and print and get those out um, or to translate as, as it were. So that's something that we'll expect the a support service contractor to do uh, 
um, hard to work with us to do. Right, and next. So in addition to uh, collaborating with the CPS and the mayor's office and DFSS, um, the other uh, uh, entity that in order to collaborate for recruitment especially that the, the, the contractor will have to do is, is collaborate with the local child care resources and referral network. And they run the Chicago Early Learning Hotline. Um, and so uh, the Child Care Resources and Referral Network is a state contract um, where essentially uh, they're, they're all over the state um, in various locations and local families can call up and find out what kind of child care is available in their local area. So for Cook County, um, it's Action for Children. And we work with them, of course, very closely um, since all of our uh, uh, centers are licensed and, uh, and, and families may call them up asking for child care. And since we're the largest provider of child care across the city, we have a pretty close relationship with them. And so as part of this messaging campaign, there'll be some um, coordination with them as well as CPS, like I said, in the mayor's office. Okay. Next slide. Right, and so to that end, um, the support service uh, agency will, the, the support service contractor for strategic communications and recruitment will have to uh, participate in these citywide recruitment meetings. They're most intense uh, in the late spring, summer, um, when we're doing uh, the most intensive recruitment, um, trying to fill programs across the city and the like. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the kind of expectations, the time expectations are um, spelled out in the uh, cost proposal. Okay, next slide. Then in addition, we reserved um, additional dollars, I think around $100,000 for additional consulting projects. You know, these are special projects that haven't been defined by the RFP in the RFP. These may be things where you're, you, as a subject matter expert, says, oh, you really need to do this, and here's what we think you should do. And so we want to make sure that there is some uh, latitude to allow for that um, so that we have additional consulting projects kind of earmarked out in the cost proposal. Um, related, of course, to strategic communications and recruitment. Next slide. Right. So we have a, uh, for this RFP, we have a cost proposal budget. Um, it's one of the attachments, I think, that you find on the city's uh, e-procurement page. Um, these cost proposals will be the basis for billing for hourly rates, for trainings, et cetera. Um, additional services, um, we have, you can see at the bottom of the cost proposal, there's an estimated budget for the extended price. Um, but the details of how that budget would be spent, like for traditional media, that's something that um, when we sit down with the contractor and we figure out you know, what the campaign is and, and, and what the recommendation is, uh, the detail of what that's gonna look like will be um, worked out. And also for some of these things, um, We'll ask you to get us a quote, and we'll see uh, whether or not um, the, the quote is a, a reasonable or, or within reason, given what we could do in in-house for it, um, for printing and things like that. That we do have some capacity to do, but maybe not uh, enough to uh, meet the need. Um, so uh, that's the cost proposal um, piece. Next slide. Required qualifications. Um, obviously, we want somebody with expertise in strategic communications, marketing, marketing communications, advertising, public relations, or a related field. Um, you know, we want to know that you can design this kind of campaign to reach our targeted audience, um, and that you have the capacity to measure the efficacy of that campaign with us, um, with some of the data we collect as well. Um, we, you need to have the infrastructure and the staffing in order to coordinate this. Um, we want to have an, a, an account director or a lead 
somebody who's the main point of contact for us to facilitate easy communication back and forth, and also who would attend um, these uh, coordination meetings that take place during the heavy recruitment season with the mayor's office and CPS and Action for Children. Um, and and uh, so um, those are the uh, qualifications. Uh, next slide. So we have some performance metrics, you know, the outcomes we want to see, and, and this, these are things that we track, is increased enrollment. Um, uh, we want to make sure that we are reaching hard to reach and isolated uh, populations, and we'll measure um, uh, the impact by enrollment and attendance. <clears throat> We also um, sometimes use feedback surveys, or we would like to see feedback surveys so we can know, you know, is the campaign and is the messaging meeting the families that we want to target? Um, so we might look at the number of children and families from special targeted populations who um, enroll. We might look at, uh, we would like to see something put in place that would, uh, where we could track oh, this family enrolled via this event or through this outreach method. Um, so we can know, well, what's really working um, strategically with marketing and enrolling children into these programs? Um, so those are sort of the outcomes and outputs that we're interested in. Those are something that will be nailed down um, at the time of contracting. All right, next uh, slide. Uh, so this is in the RFP guidance to applicants submittal documents. Please submit your resumes and credentials for the account director and key staff in an organizational chart. Uh, please feel free to submit. We encourage you to submit some samples of past recruitment, marketing, and messaging campaigns. Um, and lastly, some sample training agendas, especially about, you know, if you have a 20 uh, early childhood leaders uh, who are running uh, early childhood sites, um, what would you tell them? What would you say, how would you train them to implement uh, locally uh, an effective uh, marketing um, and outreach, uh, to, to implement effective uh, marketing and outreach strategies? Next. Um, the other thing to know is that there is a non-federal share requirement, 33%. Uh, examples of non-federal share uh, include uh, volunteers, um, donated spaces, college interns, uh, donated supplies, discounted space for uh, rent. Um, you can find out more about non-federal match in the Uniform Guidance Title II, Part 200, Subpart E, Cost Principles, but also be aware that we understand that support service contractors don't always have a lot of volunteers or a lot of donations, um, and so there is the potential to get the non-federal share requirement waived in whole or in part. Um, so that's probably important to know. Uh, next slide. So administrative costs are capped at 10%. There's a line where you can put them in, in the cost proposal. Um, that can include your indirect rate if you have one. Um, and so, and this is another thing where uh, prior to the contract execution, we'll work with you to get, um, uh, to, to figure out the budget for administrative costs for your agency. Uh, so that'll be helpful as well. Uh, next slide. The term is a two-year contract, December 1st, 2020 to November 30th, uh, 2022. It may be extended for one additional year, so that's three years. Uh, we're going to make one award. Uh, right now, the award amount looks like it's between $900,000 and $950,000. Um, yeah, it's on a reimbursement basis only, uh, so there's no advances. It's going to be cost allocated across four uh, uh, four federal funding streams, Head Start, Early Head Start, Early Head Start Child Care Partnership, and Early Head Start Expansion Funds, and 
um, I think if you look at the RFP, you'll see that it also is cost allocated across early childhood block grant funding, which is preschool for all and prevention and initiative. I failed to put that in the um, the, the PowerPoint. Um, okay, next slide. So the selection criteria and basis of award. Um, we want to uh, know what you propose to do. So the, um, there are questions under the heading of strength of proposed program, which you'll be um, evaluated on. Um, we're gonna evaluate how you'll provide the recruitment, marketing and messaging services. Um, whether or not these are appropriate to addressing our needs and uh, achieving the desired outcomes, uh, how you'll support strategic communications, um, how you're going to use best practices in your field in order to enhance our enrollment and recruitment. Um, and we want to see that you understand some of the challenges of working with our target audience who isn't um, always um, easy to find um, and reach. Uh, so then the, the second kind of general cluster of uh, selection criteria is around program performance outcomes and quality. We're going to want to see some evidence of past, uh, past campaigns, uh, past uh, efforts you've made, um, either in general or to this target population. Um, we want to make sure that you have relevant systems and processes needed to track and report performance on program outcomes and outputs. Um, and that you have experience using data to kind of direct some of these strategies and uh, some of the campaign. Um, because certainly um, we have a lot of data um, about uh, the children and families in Chicago that you can find in the community needs assessment. Uh, next, uh, the third area for um, evaluation is organizational capacity. We want to make sure that you have qualified and experienced staff for the management of the program, the adequate infrastructure for monitoring program expenditures, and you have fiscal controls. Uh, we want to make sure that you have adequate human resources capacity, especially to manage staff and or to take on subcontractors to, um, to meet some of the different requirements of this RFP, strategic communications and recruitment. Um, and we want to make sure that uh, uh, your organization, we would like to see how it reflects and engages the diverse people of the communities it serves, i.e. Chicago. Um, um, so uh, that's another um, thing we look for. Uh, last, uh, the last area, reasonable cost budget justification and leverage of funds. Um, you know, we want to see that you have the fiscal capacity to implement the proposed program. Um, we want to see if there's any other funds that that can be in-kind contributions that will be contributed. And lastly, just that the uh, reasonable implementation costs and funding requests um, uh, relative to uh, the uh, cost proposal. Next. Applications are due August 13th, 2020 at 12 noon. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Julia, who will tell you all about e-procurement. Yes, thank you guys so much. Um, okay, so we're everybody who needs to, to make an application for the city for any RFP that DFSS issues, you're going to need to access the, our, the City of Chicago's e-procurement system. So we're going to go over a few like helpful hints about how to do that, how to get the kind of technical assistance and support that you might need to complete the application successfully. And then I'm going to show you the screenshots for two common things that you'll need to do. One is an accept an amendment. Uh, we tend to do at least one amendment for all of our RFPs, if for no other reason than to upload the webinar and upload the question and answers that we get on the RFP. And then I also go through the screens on how to submit. Um, and both of these take a few more screens than, than anybody ever really thinks, but let's get started. So Tom, can we go to the next slide, please? So I can't stress this enough. First of all, if you've never, start early. My mantra for working in e-procurement is start early, save often. 
And I really, really can't stress this much you know, enough. If you've never done business with the city of Chicago, you're gonna need to register in the iSupplier e-procurement um, environment as quickly as possible. The application process takes a couple of days for DPS, the Department of Procurement Services, to process your application. Um, I thought I was looking at the, the questions that people had written. Um, if you, we can't enter into a contract unless you can do business. Um, and I'm not sure if you'll even be able to register into e-procurement if you don't have an active FIN number, you know, a, a FIN or an IEN number, an employee uh, from the government, or an, a 501c3 that has actually been processed. We can't do a contract with people who have their enter into a contract with you unless you can do business. And we don't, generally speaking, do business as far as the federal government is concerned, is about, you know, really concerned um, actually being able to do business. Not that your application has been submitted, not that it has been pended to the federal government for these for this stuff, but is actually you have the piece of paper. Um, I like to tell people that to review the RFP carefully. There's a lot of information. I know that these are dense dense documents that these are not, you know, this is, this is, it is not a romance novel, it is not a mystery. Um, they're really jam packed, but everything aligns with everything else. So our RFP scopes and narratives align very closely with our evaluation criteria and the selection criteria that we talk about in the RFPs. And those align very closely with the application questions that we're asking you. And all of those things align with the evaluation criteria that we use to ultimately review your application with and make funding decisions by. So if you have a question when you're looking at applications, the application questions, if you're thinking to yourself, this question doesn't work for me, I don't really know what they're asking for, the first stop is to go into that RFP document to look and see in the scope how we address what we're looking for. And I think that you can generally will get a better idea of how the application or what, we're, what the answer really needs to be, what part of your business you need to emphasize. So, really use the information for guidance in formulating your answers. Um, also, there's a ton of information about our, the criteria that we use to, use to select your application, but also just the kind of baseline operating criteria that we have in terms of the kind of insurance we're looking for, where the money is coming from, what the match amount is, if there's an administrative cap, all of that stuff is in that RFP document. Um, so that that's just you know a plug please read the rfp we spend a lot of time working on these rfps to make them as informative and as you know um helpful and illuminating as possible and so that's really your first stop i also look tell people to look in the rfp to uh, the selection criteria that shows you where our priorities are that shows you the things that are going to be the most important to us all of our applications align, questions align with that selection criteria and all of our evaluation criteria, which that we use to kind of grade the application question that you were, you know, the response to the application question is built on, you know, built into that selection criteria and all ties up. So let's talk physically, e-procurement. There's a 4,000 space uh, character limit on each text box. So each Application question has like a text box that you can answer and every one of those text box has a 4,000 character limit, which is probably about a page and a half or two pages. It includes punctuation and spaces. So you use a comma, you add a space, that's part of that. Those things are count as characters. Um, the e-procurement system is not going to tell you when it's cutting, when you have overshot your 4,000 characters. Uh, you wouldn't find that out until you actually sub go to submit the application. So I tell people really write your application questions into a Word document, do the character counts there, and then you won't have your answer cut off midstream. Um, the other thing that I like to tell people is that when you hit submit, that application is submitted to us and you don't have access to it. It's like a weird kind of thing that I don't really understand why we did it that way, but once you submit that application, it is gone. So if you wanna have a record of what you told us, it's really best to keep a file of all your answers in Word. Um, the e-procurement system works best in the Internet Explorer browser. 
I can use it in, I've used it in Chrome, I've used it in Safari with very little problems, but if you're having an issue with the getting kicked out a lot or stuff just not working, try using it in the Internet Explorer. Um, I will say preemptively, I've been working in this system with for three years, it doesn't crash, it hasn't gone down 99% of the time. If somebody is having a problem with getting e-procurement to work for them, it is because their computer is not working well with the e-procurement system. It's an Oracle-based platform for those of you who know or care, but it's generally speaking, it doesn't go down, it doesn't have a lot of problems, it doesn't glitch, you know, there are a few little, there are a few sort of like bugs in it, but generally speaking, those bugs have been ironed out. And so if you're having a lot of problems, you're getting kicked out, try putting it in a different browser, default to Internet Explorer, and, gen but general, and, and give yourself extra time, which is, goes back to my sort of start early mantra. Um, and then the other question, the other kind of pro tip I want to tell you is don't use the back button browser button when you are manipulating your way through e-procurement. If you do that, it stops recording, it stops saving what you're doing. And eventually when you go to save, it will kick you out. And when you go back in, none of the stuff that you have done since you hit that back browser button will have been recorded. So let's go to the next um, slide here. So you can submit your application in e-procurement. Uh, you can, one of the nice things about it is that you can submit it and then if you decide, oh, oh, I would need to update it, I need to amend it, I need to, I didn't do something right, I want to add something more, you can pull it back and you can do that up until the due date and time. The thing about, um, you know, so you can submit and then it's there, it's a placeholder. If it's not complete, it's sort of like better than, than nothing. Um, and so you really want to be able, you know, so I really tell people to do that. E-procurement, really, we are not able to accept late applications at all. The only way we can do that is by reissuing the entire RFP, which would mean that everybody who did get their application in on time would have to submit again. And so that um, we just generally, we have reissued RFPs, but we have never reissued RFPs because somebody missed the deadline. So I really, really stress to people, do not miss the deadline. Avoid the rush of possible mishaps by submitting early. Plan on your submission, the submission process taking 30 to 60 minutes. Even better if you can do it the day before. I have sat and watched applications not be submitted because people ran out of time. They weren't expecting the kind to have to, to go through the, the five screens that you have to go through to do the submission and make the corrections that the system wanted you to make in order to, to go forward. And so just just plan on it getting in early. This is due August 13th. August 12th is a great day to turn in that application. Um, if you need help, you can call me, you can call the e-procurement hotline, and that is 744-HELP. My phone number is in the RFP, and it's at the end of this webinar. It's 312-743-1679. Um, that actually, since we're all working from home, that number goes to straight to my cell phone. So chances are you'll get me, you know, you'll you'll get me. You can email me, you can get me. I try to return all of my phone calls within 24 and, and emails about stuff within 24 hours. Uh, the e-procurement hotline will sometimes be 24 to 48 hours. The hotline, notice note that the hotline operates during business hours, Monday through Friday, nine to five. I tend to be a little bit more generous. And, and if I, you if you email me, you know, if you're if you're taking the time to email me or call me, I'll pretty much regardless, you know, if I'm not asleep, I will try to call or or reach out to you really quickly. Um, so again, save often, submit early. Let's go to the next slide. And here we will see um, in this next slide, you'll see just some links. So if you have questions about registration, go to customer support, email customer support at cityofchicago.org. If you have technical assistance needs, you can email customer support or call the helpline. And then also, if you're a person that doesn't mind, like, you know, that you like to learn a little bit more at your own pace or you don't necessarily need that human touch, there's a lot of training materials. I have a lot of sort of things PowerPoints that I PDF that I send out to people just to come, you know, to to help them. So with the screenshots and some common 
issues or common questions that people have in, in working in the e-procurement environment. So most of, a lot of them are up on that training materials link. If you can't find something that you need, just give me a call or, or call the helpline and we can, we we'll either will walk you through the, we'll walk you through it or we'll send you PowerPoints with, with really nice screenshots that you can read. So let's go to the next thing. Uh, and then we're going to talk about how to accept an amendment. As um, I talked said earlier, we tend to do one amendment for every RFP, knock on wood. Um, that amendment is going to contain the webinar PowerPoint, which is, I think also we also post on the DFSS website. There's a link, a YouTube link that's posted to on the DFSS website to this specific PowerPoint with our dialogue and you know going we're answering the question. And then we also have um, an FAQ document of the frequently asked questions or the questions that come out of this webinar or any other questions that we've asked, been asked that we post as part of the amendment. So if you've already started your application or if you're starting the application, you're gonna to need to accept the amendment prior to being able to either go forward and continue with the application or to start your, your new application um, that you haven't yet started. And that you need to actually go through quite a number of screens to, act, to accept the amendment. When we talk about, um, you'll see from the process, we really want you to not to engage and read the amendment. It might have some interesting questions that you had. That we have very comprehensive answers. Um, you know, we we are holding you responsible, or specifically the e-procurement, the city of Chicago is demanding that we help hold you responsible for the contents of that amendment. So if there's something in the amendment that was information. You know, amendments can do anything. We're doing them for sort of webinar and FAQ types of stuff. But if we say we had to change the due date, when you're accepting the amendment, you are attesting to the fact that the due date, that you know that the due date has changed and you are going to be held, you're going to be held responsible for the contents of that amendment. So I highly suggest that you at least, you know, you at least glance at it just uh, to do yourself a favor since you are going to be held responsible for that. So let's get the start, The um, go to the next slide and we can, we can get that process started. So in order to start an application, this is the screen you're gonna get. Um, you can see on the right-hand side, the activities create quote and go. When you hit create quote and go, that's gonna take you, that's how you start an application in e-procurement. You'll see the warning here talks about that your RFQ has been amended and that you're gonna have to acknowledge the amendment to, to be able to continue or to start. So you're gonna, you'll, if you're starting an application, you'll go to create quote, you'll hit go, and that will take you to the next slide. Um, and in the next slide, you're gonna start the acceptance and acknowledgement process. So if you wanna look at the RFP document itself, in e-procurement, everything that is highlighted, kind of a blue highlight, you can click on and it will take you to something else. So, when you, if you want to look at the RFP, you can look under the document number. You'll see, so there's, um, and if you click on that number, it will take you to the RFP screen and document the application questions. But that, and then um, if you want to actually review the changes that are the actual amendment document, you're going to hit the little eyeglass icon, which I have circled as number two. And then if, um, and then that is how you can, see what you're kind of getting yourself into here with this amendment. And when you've done that, you're gonna hit the acknowledge amendment button. You can see that there's one on the upper right-hand side and kind of one on the lower right-hand side. That's kind of an e-procurement design thing that you often have the ability to click on the same thing at either the top or the bottom on the right-hand side, sort of foreshadowing for you. Um, can we go to the next slide? So when you acknowledge the amendment, you'll then get to a screen where you have to accept the acknowledgement, and you will um, do that by uh, clicking this really tiny box saying that you accept the terms and conditions of the RFQ and acknowledge the changes made through the amendment document that's been uploaded. Um, and then you will hit the acknowledge on the upper right hand side and that will take you to the next screen where you indicate yes to confirm the acknowledge your acknowledgement of your amendment. So you can see we really actually want you to to, to embrace the amendment and and take a look at it and make sure. So after you agree to that, you're going to hit yes, and that will take you to the next screen where you will 
finally click on the checkbox at the bottom of the left hand side which says that you accept the terms and conditions and then you will click on the accept button which is on either the top or the bottom of the right hand side and this is the final step in acknowledging and accepting your amendment at which point you will be able to either start your application or if you had already started your application your app your your already saved work will be pulled into the the new amendment format so that is how we accept an amendment so now we're going to go on and i want to show you how to submit how to submit an application so submitting and now you'll see kind of how why it's going to take why it takes a, i tell people to give themselves you know 30 to 60 minutes so when you're ready to submit, you're going to start by saving your draft one last time by hitting the Save Draft button, and then you're going to click Continue. And at that point, eProcurement is going to look at your whole application and it's going to kind of flag stuff that that might not it might not sort of like jive with, I guess. Um, you know, it's it's it checks to make it checks it's going to check your application for completeness as it defines the application to be complete, not how you or I, but just how it does. And, and so that often requires, that often results in some error messages. And so we're gonna to go to the next slide. Um, so this is after you've completed your hit continue, chances are you'll get an error message and the error message will, will be on the top of the page, the top of the, the left-hand side, and it will tell you, you know, you, you might get a, a number of them and it will tell you kind of, uh, it will tell you, you know, it will give you hints as to how to resolve. So we're going to go to the next screen. So, um, so it, like in this, the last screen that I showed you, this particular thing says you must. The error message is, you know, usually direct to something that's left undone in the application. So this this particular error message says you must quote on at least one line in the RFQ. Um, so you kind of look for the keywords in line, and then there's the lines tab right under that. And that would be you would go into the lines tab and you put in placeholder. We don't the lines tab is something the li lines are something that we need at contracting, but we don't use it as part of our evaluation process. We defer to the cost proposal or to the budgets that we're requiring you that you upload. Um, but but the system does like you to put in some placeholder numbers, and so if you haven't done that, it will it will tell you that you have to quote, which means answer on at least one line in the RFQ. So let's go to the next screen. Another error that we got is an error about an unanswered question in the application. And, and in this case, applica the applications are referred to as the are found in the requirements section and a quote value refers to your answer. Um, this particular error message says the quote value is required for the requirement, first name. And so the requirement is the question first name is sort of the name of the question so you would go in and you would look for the requirement entitled first name and then you would go into the quote value section you would type in the first name and and save and then you should be able to go forward so let's go to the next the next screen. thank you so once your application is free from errors you are ready to proceed and submit and so at this point you're gonna um go you're going to to hit the continue button, and that's going to put you into your review and submit phase, which you can see, as it's because it is indicated in the um, on the upper left left hand side as you're in the review and submit phase. So after that, you can see here you have a couple of different you know you can basically you're going you're going to be able to review your entire application. So let's go to the next slide, and if this is the last chance you have to see all of your answers kind of in one place you can see all of your attachments and then you can you'll scroll all the way to the bottom which is the next slide and you can see all of your responses so if you scroll to the go to the next slide i'll show you the, the bottom and at the bottom of the screen there's an electronic signature box so here's a tip um, putting your name and title before you click that tiny little box if you click the box first like i did um you'll get an error message and you'll just have to do it again so put in your name put in the title click the box and then you're going to hit um the uh continue button or i think the save draft button um it's at this point you can also do a, a printable view if you want to get a printable view of your 
of your RFP, that's also helpful. Remember, once you submit it to us, you're not going to have access to it. So say get the get the PDF, and then you're going to hit submit. Um, and let's go to the next slide. Now you have submitted. We you'll get this confirmation screen, which you want to see. If you don't get the confirmation screen, you haven't submitted. Now we've also new this year. We've set up the e procurement system. We'll send you a confirmation email within 24 hours. Um, but you you want to see the confirmation screen? You'll get your email within 24 hours. If you want confirmation prior to that, you can call me. You can email me, and it's really no problem for me to check and make sure that we received your application. I'll email you right back. Um, and that's that's how you submit. Um, that concludes what I have to say about e-procurement. I am a whole, like I'm completely there for questions pretty much from now until the thing is submitted, um, this RFP is submitted. I would say that we can and do really see what people are doing in the e-procurement. So, so if you find that you have missed a deadline, we have a pretty good record of how you, you know, how far along in your application you were, how much time, you know, when you had logged in and out. Those kinds of things are very easy for us to see. And I do start really checking just, to, just because we like to know how many people might be applying. You know, we do, I do really start checking like two, two weeks out just to sort of start seeing what the activity on the system is on stuff. And so, please just submit, submit early. We love to have your applications. We hate it when people miss deadlines that they were that they wanted to. We have very little ability to change that reality, so just submit the thing. And, um, and if you miss the deadline, I guess, just know that, it, that it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, to have it changed. I mean, unless, we, unless for some reason or another we need to reissue the RFP, it's not, it's, you, you really are not gonna have the opportunity to, to make up that missed deadline. I think that right now we're gonna turn it over to questions. I can see that there actually are a number of questions already in the queue. Um, most of these, you know, I'll, I'm around for this, but uh, that's, Beth will be answering most of these because I'm sure these are more programmatic. Um, so Beth, um, why don't you go ahead and, and, and read off the uh, questions and we'll answer, Julie and I'll answer them as appropriate as we go. Okay, Beth, and as, as you uh, go over the questions, I'm just going to go to the next page of the okay. of the presentation because it just has your contact information so people um, have that and they can write it down during this time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of these questions were all asked in different parts of the RF um, presentation, so they may have been answered. Um, so I'm just going to read them off from the top and just note that some of the questions were asked during certain sections. A lot of them were mostly asked during uh, your presentation, Beth. Okay. Um, and, but Julie will be able to provide answers too, I think, to some of these. Mm -hmm. um, and if you've answered them, just go ahead and give the best summary you can. Will you be providing a list of those on the call to find partnership opportunities? Yes. So um, I spoke to um, somebody in our procurement office, and we will be issuing with the FAQ in the First Amendment a list of who is um, on the call for potential uh, partnerships and collaborations. Is there an incumbent? If yes, who? Is there an incumbent? Um, you know, an know. Incumbent, yes, there, there is an incumbent. I think somebody already has this contract. Well, um, we don't have a we don't have a direct contractor for this. Actually. OK, so there isn't really an incumbent. <laughs> All right. Um, and if that person wants to uh, ask a follow up to that or something or a follow up to any these questions, go ahead and type it in your box. Are there any, um, this was asked again, these first like five questions were asked before your presentation started. Are there any diversity goals? Uh, 
No, I don't think so. Um, outside of the diversity that um, in the, I think it's in the organizational uh, piece. Uh, yeah. And Julia, this, uh, this, go ahead. Our delegate agency contracts aren't required to have MBE or WBE. That's not part of our contracting, if that's what you're meaning. And this next question, I think, was answered by Julia before um, to this person. Is subcontracting allowed? Yes. Yes. And I think Julia said it's covered on page 12 of the RFP document. Mm -hmm. Does 501c3 also available to be used? Sure, you can be a 501c3 or not. It's It's not required. Okay. You do have to be able to do, do, do business in Illinois. So like no pending 501c3s, but but you can be for profit or nonprofit. That doesn't matter. And what NAICS codes did you use for the RFP? We didn't. Uh, okay. Um, hello, can we get this information emailed to us? Uh, I saw a couple of those questions throughout the during the presentation. As we discussed, the the YouTube the this video will be um, put up on our the DFSS website. A link to this on YouTube. Um, this will be part this the PowerPoint and the uh, and the FAQs are going to be put up as part of the amendment to the RFP. Um, Beth, I don't know if you want to email this the webinar out to no. all the people who were here. So, so when when the amendment comes out, which will um, hopefully be next week, it will have links to everything so you can access them on your own. All right. Um, one of the 501c3 questions was uh, asked: Is it considered a community-based program? I don't know. Uh, I, I'm. I don't understand really what the question is. I mean, our okay. Chicago early learning programs are community based insofar as they're not delivered in Chicago public schools. But this RFP is not for community based early learning programs. This RFP is for a support service contractor to provide strategic communications and recruitment, and that contractor can be a 501c3, but it can be for profit as well. You know, typically uh, we don't find for profits in advertising, but maybe I'm wrong about that. And I think you might have answered this next question a couple different ways, but when will the Q&A be posted? I think this kind of goes all together with just when is stuff posted. And next, um, we'll, we'll try for next week, right, Julia? Okay. Right. And uh, again, thank you. Sorry, I might I'm try my best to read all the questions. Yeah, if some fine. of them are repetitive, just that's fine. let me know. Given the COVID-19 restrictions, how does that impact the RFP? Well, it, it insofar as uh, the timeline, uh, it doesn't impact it. Insofar as uh, creative strategies to reach families. Um, so this this RFP, uh, the contract would begin for this RFP December 1st, 2020. And the recruitment season for the 2021 school year is at, so it'd be for the 21 22 school year program year would be the first kind of that would be ratcheting up for. So, you know, hopefully, who knows, nobody really knows what the situation of the world will be you know, a year and a half from now. Um, the the funding, as, as long as the funding avail is, is available, the funding will stay the same. Uh, will there need to be adjustments in strategies depending on the state of uh, Illinois and COVID-19? Perhaps um, 
right now our agencies are opening there the there are special um, guidelines for agencies to be reopening um, with the COVID-19 through uh, DCFS licensing that licenses all childcare uh, facilities in the state of Illinois. So, um, so we are recruiting right now for the coming year and we will continue to recruit and programs will continue to operate uh, regardless of uh, of COVID-19 because like right now we've been operating remotely so parents have been accessing programs remotely and if something were to happen and there was a shelter in place order the same thing would happen again I'm kind of babbling on so I think that that answers the question is the IRS determination letter mentioned on page 7 mandatory for submission the IRS site says it takes three to six months to process a request Right. You can't, as I talked about earlier, you really can't enter into a contract with the city until you have the ability to do business. So if you're waiting on an IRS determination letter for your nonprofit status, but you can do business just as a business and that's for profit, I don't see why that you couldn't just apply, why you couldn't use that ability and, and do that. You don't have to be a nonprofit to, to operate, you know, to apply for this R RFP. But you can't, you, it can't be pending. Um, if you don't have a number, we can't do business with you. And as the RR says, it says it takes three to six months to process a request. So if you haven't gotten your request in, then you can't do business. And we're, you know, we're probably, we're looking to have our contract start December 1st. You know, that's, we've, we've been burned on that. Okay. Um, let's see this, these questions, let's see, start getting into, uh, some of the budget marketing and media, uh, given that this is a citywide campaign, is there a budget for digital or social media advertising? If so, how much is it? Yes, that's in the cost proposal, which I don't have in front of me right now. The uh, okay. the entire budget for is uh, between nine hundred and nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Right now, in that cost proposal for di traditional media, digital marketing, printing, promos, uh, materials, we have uh, amounts earmarked for each of those categories and, and you'll see that when you open the cost proposal when which you'll get when you go into the e-procurement system um, and if you have future questions after looking at that please uh, reach out to me and um, i'll be more than happy to uh, answer them okay good that answers another question about what is the budget i think and what is the budget range it's nine hundred to ninety nine hundred fifty thousand dollars annually right now. All of this is, of course, dependent on our receipt of federal and state funding, and I think that that's written into the RFP, and and that's also written into contracts. Great. Are grassroots tactics, including specialized events, leveraging existing relationships and target communities, approved marketing activities for this campaign? Yes. And should the vendor include media ad buys in the cost proposal? You'll see um, you'll see in the cost proposal that media ad buys are included kind of in the special category in the bottom. Um, so we're asking you in the cost proposal to like tell us a lot about um, hourly rates, your agency's hourly rates, or the subcontractors you're going to use hourly rates, what we can expect to. And then we have a certain amount earmarked for like uh, traditional media buys, uh, promos, like I said, digital, and the like. And and the way the cost proposal works is that we just have a lump sum for, for those categories, uh, for buys, for example. And then um, with the chosen contractor, uh, will um, determine as we go uh, kind of how that money will be spent uh, in a collaborative process based on the campaign that ends up uh, getting designed. 
Uh, another question is, is there any event support needed for conferences in the sort? Uh, no, conferences right now is not included under this budget or under this contractor. All right. And then the next questions, uh, well, let's see, they kind of grouped here together. There's at least three or four of them here. And I'll just kind of read them and then I'll let you, will this PowerPoint be made available after the webinar? Will the presentation slides be available? Will a list of the webinars participants be made available? Will the presentations and slides? Yes, yes, so yes. So there's just a lot of questions. Yes, you were answering those earlier. That's the amendment. And if for some reason um, you aren't able to access the amendment or you want to know if the amendment has been published, just reach out, uh, email Julia and myself, and we will um, let you know if it's been posted yet so you can access it. But like I said, we're going to try to get the amendment out um, by Wednesday, I think we can say. Right. Thank you. Uh, can you add PDF or JPEGs to submission on e-procurement? Oh, yeah. Please, please, please. JPEG, definitely PDF your, your submissions. That's much better for us than having to get something like, you know, to get a uh, a Word document. So yeah, you, you can totally do that. Uh, what is the cutoff date for RFP questions? So we're gonna, you know, we don't generally have a hard cutoff date. Um, we will be doing the amendment. If we get questions post, the doing post the amendment post this opportunity um sometimes what we'll do you know we'll obviously we'll answer them and we'll a, we'll ask uh we'll we'll sub just do another amendment so there there at this point there really isn't a cutoff date all righty um let's see well does does the $900,000 include the cost of the media buy? Also wanted to confirm that this is the budget, $900,000 for two years. That was kind of another question later on in the last 10 minutes was asked about that too. Is it one year, two year? So, so right so, now the budget is 900 to $950,000 annually. So okay. that means that 950, the night let's say nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars for december first twenty twenty through november thirtieth twenty twenty one and then uh another nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars from december first twenty twenty one through uh twenty twenty two right now that includes everything um as far as it goes out the way our contracts typically work is that um and you know, we assume right now that that is the amount of money that we are going to have available for strategic communications and recruitment. Um, might it change? Thank maybe, you. maybe more, maybe less. It just depends on what's needed. Um, but right now, that is what I would, um, as the applicant, that is what I would assume that it is uh, up to nine hundred fifty thousand dollars a year to cover everything. Uh, next question was, so there are no um, WBE, MBDBE procurement requirement? No, they are the not. Follow -up to delegate, agency, delegate agency contracts are exempted from WBE, MBE, and, and those requirements. That doesn't mean that we don't like to see those organizations um, applying for stuff, it just means that we don't have a percentage that we're held to. All right, uh, to number six, community events, outreach, and coordination, pages nine through 10, will these programs provide the volunteers or is the selected agency to be responsible for the recruitment and vetting of volunteers or just coordinating the volunteers? Um, and, I, and I think on the next question, you can hold will they be recruiting volunteers will background checks for volunteers be required in events that may involve minors who handles this if so so that was kind of a two-part yeah. question yeah 
So right now, the way that the cost proposal is written out, um, for community outreach, there are staff uh, hours. We want you to assign staff hours. They may be subcontracted staff, whatever, um, to community outreach events. But in addition to that, we know that we will also be coordinating some of those community outreach events with um, parent ambassadors. And as far as the parent ambassadors are concerned, they get coordinated, um, trained, et cetera, by a different organization. Um, but they will be you know, part of the function, I guess, of those, uh, the meetings with the mayor's office, CPS, and Action for Children, and the uh, recruitment and marketing specialist, i.e., the, the contractor that we're uh, going to be um, hiring through this process is going to be to ensure that some of this coordination is happening and and also depending on what the event is it uh, an event where um, volunteers are needed in addition to hired staff and if so well how is it that that can be um, accomplished and the like so there's some flexibility there I guess is what I'm saying all right um, I think this person has a couple more questions about that but before I get to that there's only there's only about five questions left. Um, mm -hmm. What site do we find the amendments? That's the amendments that's are the every, everything that you need to look at, find to make an application is going to be on e procurement. So the amendment when it's posted, really the only way you get to see the amendment is you start an application and you accept the amendment and you download the amendment document. That is how you, that is how you find, that is where you find the amendment. Uh, will there be an opportunity to upgrade the Chicago Early Learning Application Portal that's currently powered by COPA? Maybe, I don't know. So, uh, so uh, somebody, uh, when you go on to, um, right now we have a data system, um, COPA, and uh, uh, you know the department um, is always um, COPA, like other uh, contracts, ends up having uh, our data system ends up having to uh, go out for bid uh, periodically uh, to meet the city's procurement requirements. Um, and so right now, um, uh, COPA is coordinated. Uh, that's our. Um, our data system, it's associated with the um, online application, but I do not know what the status of that will be um, a year from now. All right. And I think one of the persons asked about 10 minutes ago when you were asking about budget, just for repeating, is the total budget for one year over the two years? For one year. So for one two year. years, it's uh, 950 plus 950. I, I was an English major, so somebody else. Okay. 1900, uh, 1900 uh, or what is that? It's 1900 dollars. No, more than that. I guess. About 1.9 million. Thank you. Uh, some of okay. So back to the events questions. These are the last two um, that I see here. Um, and I appreciate everybody that asked all these uh, really good questions today and sticking with us throughout the whole presentation. Some of these events include registration fees. Do we need to include those in our budget? Do those count as part of the non-federal match? No, they're not part of the non-federal match. They would be in the um, the You'll see when you when you go into e procurement and you download the cost proposal. I think that this will be kind of clear: is that there's a section in the cost proposal about the staffing hourly rates for community events, um, and then fees and the like. That that is covered kind of in the um, kind of bulk, kind of x amount of dollars uh, dedicated to the kind of fees set up. Um, you know. Uh, the, the kind of uh, 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 materials you would need for these community events and things like that. 
So the only the the only thing that's broken out is hourly rates for staffing and coordination that might have to happen related to it. Fees, the like, are in um, are in the buy kind of category at the end of the cost proposal, and there's just a flat amount of money that can be divvied up. Um, however it's determined that it makes sense given the strategy for the campaign that the vendor comes up with. And the last question we have is, uh, it's a good question potentially to end on if there's no more. Given the COVID pandemic, a lot is up in the air right now. For response purposes, should we address questions based off of the assumption that events will be taking place more quote unquote normally in 2021 <laughs> or should we anticipate COVID, COVID in our planning? Um, that is I, a really good question. <laughs> that is a really good question. I think that um, especially when it comes to, to some of the grassroots and, and the community events and the like, digital and, and other I think that what you'll see is when you go through that there'll be opportunities where you can talk about the range of potential um, strategies and it would make sense for you to do that if you're thinking very kind of realistically about the next two years and what that might look like. Um, so I would encourage you to respond in a way that is responsive to the, you know, the changing uh, conditions we're living in right now. Um, but Assume that that you know. Knock on wood. Assume that at some point you know there'll be parades and stuff like that as well. So um, I would say try when it when there's an opportunity to discuss the full range, go ahead and do so, um, and, and and that would be great. Well, I, we made it to the last slide, and that's all the questions that I have seen today. Um, sometimes when we're about to sign off, just to let people know there may be one question, I'll interrupt uh, Pastor Julia if I see another question come in, but otherwise that's all the questions that were typed up today. Okay, great. Um, so thank you everybody for um, signing in today uh, for the webinar. Uh, we look forward to reading a lot of great uh, proposals. Um, remember, they're due uh, August 13th, noon. Um, right. We will uh, we will try August to release a great the, day. Uh, we will try to release the um, the amendment uh, uh, on Wednesday, a week from today. Um, but if you don't see one, just let us know. And it, it sometimes, you know, it has it takes a minute to get it through approvals and the like. But that's what we'll aim for. And the, RF, the, the PowerPoint, this recording, and FAQs will be available at that time. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. And there's the contact information I left up on the screen as well. Great. One last time. There you go. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. All right, I'm going to end the webinar now. Thanks for attending, everybody. Have a great rest of the day.